Isaiah chapter 40 The Elijah Cup. The end of the warfare from symbol to reality. Nahum chapter 1 verse 15. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows for the wicked shall no more pass through thee, he is utterly cut off. Proclaiming peace, the healing waters. In the closing up of the atonement. Isaiah. 55 verse 1. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy, and eat, yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. John, 7 verse 37 In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me, and drink. John, 7 verse 38 He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John, 7 verse 39 But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. 1 Corinthians, 10 verse 4 And did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. 2 Corinthians, 3 verse 8 How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? 2 Corinthians, 3 verse 9 For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. 2 Corinthians, 3 verse 10 For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. 2 Corinthians, 3 verse 11 For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth as glorious. 1 John 5 verse 6 This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Joe, 33 Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John, 3 verse 4 Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb, and be born? John, 3 verse 5 Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John, 3 verse 6 That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. E. White, the pen of inspiration. The Lord would have his people sound in the faith not ignorant of the great salvation so abundantly provided for them. They are not to look forward, thinking that at some future time a great work is to be done for them, for the work is now complete. The believer is not called upon to make his peace with God, he never has nor ever can do this. He is to accept Christ, Christ she, as his peace, for with Christ as God and peace. Christ made an end of sin, bearing its heavy curse in his own body on the tree, and he hath taken away the curse from all those who believe in him as a personal saviour.
he makes an end of the controlling power of sin in the heart, and the life and character of the believer testify to the genuine character of the grace of Christ. Solemn are the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. Sunoni know how soon it will pass to the cases of the living. When the work of the investigative judgment closes, the destiny of all will have been decided for life or death. Probation is ended a short time before the appearing of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. Christ in the Revelation, looking forward to that time, declares, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. The atonement and the water of life the last message of mercy, the revelation of the Holy Spirit. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders, E. Wagoner and A. T. Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety, it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus, having their eyes upon a man. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands, not into the hands of a vice garant, that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, two in particular, as brought out in this study, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness, from our Divine Mother to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, the one that joins the third angel, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, the glory of the Son, which closes the work of the third angel, the message that was brought under the prophetic work of Scott Roden. The last message of mercy to be given to the world as a revelation of his character of love, the people will know it when they see it. The children of God are to manifest his glory, in the truth of the closing work of the daughter and in their characters. In their own life and character they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Twenty-four years have passed since the first presentation of the revelation of the Holy Spirit. After twenty long years of delay, through a counter-work of spiritual resistance, the counter-reformation in the Church, and attempted spiritual domination of this truth, this truth of the ministry of sanctification, an end of the warfare, through the closing work of the Holy Spirit, has now come to the fullness of time, the truth has broken through, for we are at the end of time. This truth is able to break through the falsehoods and delays brought about by the enemy, as depicted in Zechariah chapter 3. We are to look for a message, a teacher of righteousness, as Victor Houteff defines it.
The one gift is a special truth, a teacher of righteousness, arousing the Church from her Laodiceanism and fitting her members for the final gospel work in all the world. Foreseeing them actively engaged in this work, the Spirit of Truth declares all fear of their relatives was gone the branch family and our family circle, and the truth alone was exalted to them. I asked what had made this great change. An angel answered, It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. Not a man, but a truth, a special truth, a teacher of righteousness, not a message about a man, rather a message that uplifts the authors of our salvation, justification and sanctification, the authors of creation and the authors of the re-creation, Christ the Son and Christ the Daughter, in their final work to bring the wave sheaf body of the harvest to perfection, glorification. The loud cry of the third angel is the angel that joins the third angel, or the fourth angel in the repeat phase of the three angels' messages, the branch, the seventh angel, in the full count of the angels of Revelation chapter 14, six angels, and Revelation chapter 18 verse 1, the seventh, the final message of mercy to the church first first, then to the world. God will employ agencies that will surprise us. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things, and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. There will be those among us who will always want to control the work of God, to dictate even what movements shall be made when the work goes forward under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world. God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins in his own hands. The workers will be surprised by the simple means that he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. This message will bring the understanding of the water in relation to the atonement for the living, the last cup, at Passover, the fifth cup, the cup for Elijah, the Holy Spirit, representing the final ministration of the Divine Daughter to prepare her wave sheaf company to receive her full benefits of sanctification, that she may wear the righteousness of the saints. Those who continue with the cup mingled with grape juice, the blood symbol, perpetuating the symbol and reality of the spiritual warfare in the Church, those who cannot put their full trust in the Holy Spirit of promise, her power to bring to perfection her righteousness in her children, cannot receive the blessing and completion of her work in us. This is her work in us daily, accepting by faith all her benefits, day by day and moment by moment. The recognition of her authority to complete our salvation and bring us into unity and righteous character is the test for the body of Messiah the branch. Is the water sufficient to carry us through? Is the water of life the symbol that points to the reality, to bring us to perfection? Is water the perfect symbol? The beautiful presentation of this idea from the pen of inspiration is retold in Patriarchs and Prophets. From the smitten rock in Horeb first flowed the living stream that refreshed Israel in the desert.
During all their wanderings, wherever the need existed, they were supplied with water by a miracle of God's mercy. The water did not, however, continue to flow from Horeb. Wherever in their journeyings they wanted water, there from the clefts of the rock it gushed out beside their encampment. It was Christ, by the power of his word, that caused the refreshing stream to flow for Israel. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. He was the source of all temporal as well as spiritual blessings. Christ, the true rock, was with them in all their wanderings. They thirsted not when he led them through the deserts he caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them, he clave the rock also, and the waters gushed out, they ran in the dry places like a river, Isaiah chapter 48 verse 21, Psalm chapter 105 verse 41. The smitten rock was a figure of Christ, and through this symbol the most precious spiritual truths are taught. As the life-giving waters flowed from the smitten rock, so from Christ, smitten of God, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4, 5, the stream of salvation flows for a lost race. As the rock had been once smitten, so Christ was to be, once offered to bear the sins of many, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. Our Savior was not to be sacrificed a second time, and it is only necessary for those who seek the blessings of His grace to ask in the name of Jesus, pouring forth the heart's desire in penitential prayer. Such prayer will bring before the Lord of hosts the wounds of Jesus, and then will flow forth afresh the life-giving blood, symbolized by the flowing of the living water for Israel. The flowing of the water from the rock in the desert was celebrated by the Israelites, after their establishment in Canaan, with demonstrations of great rejoicing. In the time of Christ this celebration had become a most impressive ceremony. It took place on the occasion of the Feast of Tabernacles, when the people from all the land were assembled at Jerusalem. On each of the seven days of the feast the priests went out with music and the choir of Levites to draw water in a golden vessel from the spring of Siloam. They were followed by multitudes of the worshippers, as many as could get near the stream drinking of it, while the jubilant strains arose, With joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation, Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3. Then the water drawn by the priests was borne to the temple amid the sounding of trumpets and the solemn chant, Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem, Psalm chapter 122 verse 2. The water was poured out upon the altar of burnt offering, while songs of praise rang out, the multitudes joining in triumphant chorus with musical instruments and deep-toned trumpets. The Savior made use of this symbolic service to direct the minds of the people to the blessings that he had come to bring them. In the last day, that great day of the feast, his voice was heard in tones that rang through the temple courts, If any man thirst, let him come unto me, and drink.
He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, this, said John, spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, John chapter 7 verse 37-39. The refreshing water, welling up in a parched and barren land, causing the desert place to blossom, and flowing out to give life to the perishing, is an emblem of the divine grace which Christ alone can bestow, and which is as the living water, purifying, refreshing, and invigorating the soul. He in whom Christ is abiding has within him a never-failing fountain of grace and strength. Jesus cheers the life and brightens the path of all who truly seek him. His love, received into the heart, will spring up in good works unto eternal life. And not only does it bless the soul in which it springs, but the living stream will flow out in words and deeds of righteousness, to refresh the thirsting around him. We may be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, but his righteousness will not be a covering for the least iniquity, wash you, make you clean, for there has been a fountain opened for Judah and Jerusalem, and every stain may be cleansed away. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16 to 18. Look, thirsty, bewildered souls. Can ye not see the fountain of life opened for the weary, wayworn traveler? Can ye not hear the voice of mercy as she beckons to you, saying, Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Whosoever will, let him take the water off life freely. The waters of this fountain contain medical properties which will heal spiritual and physical infirmities. All are invited to wash away their pollution in this fountain. Drink deeply from the fountain opened for Judah and Jerusalem. Then you can take the refreshing cup to parched, fainting souls. The same figure Christ had employed in his conversation with the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John chapter 4 verse 14. Christ combines the two types. He is the rock, he is the living water. The same beautiful and expressive figures are carried throughout the Bible. Centuries before the advent of Christ, Moses pointed to him as the rock of Israel's salvation Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 15, the psalmist sang of him as my redeemer, the rock of my strength, the rock that is higher than I. A rock of habitation, rock of my heart, rock of my refuge. In David's song his grace is pictured also as the cool, still waters, amid green pastures, beside which the heavenly shepherd leads his flock. Again, thou shalt make them, he says, drink of the river, the eastward flow, Ezekiel chapter 47 of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life, Psalm chapter 19 verse 14, 62 verse 7, Psalm chapter 61 verse 2, 71 verse 3, 73 verse 26, 94 verse 22, 23 verse 2, 36 verse 8, 9. And the wise man declares, the wellspring of wisdom is as a flowing brook, Proverbs chapter 18 verse 4. 
to Jeremiah, Christ as the fountain of living waters, to Zechariah, a fountain opened, for sin and for uncleanness, Jeremiah 2 verse 13, Zechariah chapter 13 verse 1. Isaiah describes him as the rock of ages, and the shadow of a great rock in a weary land, Isaiah chapter 26 verse 4, 32 verse 2. And he records the precious promise, bringing vividly to mind the living stream that flowed for Israel, when the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I the Lord will hear them, I the God of Israel will not forsake them. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground, in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. The invitation is given, Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, Isaiah chapter 41 verse 17, 44 verse 3, Isaiah chapter 35 verse 6, 55 verse 1. And in the closing pages of the sacred word this invitation is echoed. The river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeds from the throne of God and the Lamb, and the gracious call is ringing down through the ages, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely, Revelation chapter 22 verse 17. Just before the Hebrew host reached Kadesh, the living stream ceased that for so many years had gushed out beside their encampment. It was the Lord's purpose again to test his people. He would prove whether they would trust his providence or imitate the unbelief of their fathers. This is how we have been led as a people in our very distant past. Now, this reality, from the symbol to the reality, brings us to recount our recent history, and now we stand on the banks of the Jordan River, in a message of the Holy Spirit and the end of her warfare, to receive the faith in her final ministration and thereby cross the Jordan spiritually, in the day of small things. We have nothing to fear for the future. Recounting our recent history in the unfolding of the repeat of the third angel's message, we know that in 1986 Lois Roden began teaching about the Divine Daughter, who was hidden in the skirt of the Divine Mother, message. Shortly before that, in the fall of 1985, she announced the coming of the Holy Spirit in the power of the Holy Ghost. She stated that this coming of the Holy Ghost would be in person. In the first advent of Messiah, he came with the Holy Spirit in power, but in the second advent, he will come with the Holy Spirit in person, who has to be announced, and revealed in a prophetic message beforehand by her earthly representative. Before the visible second coming of Christ we must receive Christ the Holy Spirit in person, and when she comes in person, she is to announce the return of her bridegroom. The Jews have always known that before the Messiah comes, they are to expect the return of the Shekinah, the messenger of the covenant, to prepare the way. That the Divine Daughter came in person means that although she took on flesh at the cross, when the veil of his flesh was torn in two. Her earthly ministration as our sin-bearer, our other Messiah, another Comforter, who has been put away, separated from her Beloved in Heaven, for our sins as a menstruating woman. 
Lamentations chapter 1 verse 17, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 1. She is the fountain of blood symbolized by water that, although always opened for sin, in 1990 opened for uncleanness. By faith, I acknowledge that the fountain of her blood which flows afresh daily washes away, cleanses, blots out my sin so that I am always clean, day by day, moment by moment. This state of being preserved in cleanness is achieved by her selfless daily work on my behalf, as I accept her intercession by faith and cooperate with her ministration by not dismissing her, grieving her, or speaking evil of her. Our Saviour was not to be sacrificed a second time, and it is only necessary for those who seek the blessings of His grace to ask in the name of Jesus, pouring forth the heart's desire in penitential prayer. Such prayer will bring before the Lord of hosts the wounds of Jesus, and then will flow forth afresh the life-giving blood, symbolized by the flowing of the living water for Israel. When we pray in our everlasting Father's name, pouring forth the heart's desire, those penitential prayers will bring the wounds of Yahshua before her, the Lord of hosts, and then the blood symbolized by the flowing living water her blood will flow afresh. In other words, our penitential prayer recalls to her the self-sacrificing love of Yahshua for her children and she joins him in forgiving the sins of the living. This fresh flowing blood is a picture of the judgment of the living. It is time to recognize this truth, or be left behind. This is not a picture of Yahshua being re-wounded every time we sin. Just the opposite, the penitential prayer for our sins, calls forth her intercessory living blood, water that flows for the ever-living ones who are to be translated alive to the marriage in heaven, then to return and testify of the event of the ages. Though higher than any of the angels, though as great as the Father on the throne of heaven he became one with us. In him, God and man became one, and it is in this fact that we find the hope of our fallen race. Looking upon Christ, in the flesh, we look upon God in humanity, Adam and Eve, and see in him the brightness of divine glory, spirit, female, the express image of God, the father male and female, Genesis. 1 verse 26, 27, 5 verse 1, 2. So the Son was first revealed as one person in the flesh, then two, since the Holy Ghost has been revealed, as the second Eve. Christ was the second Adam who went to sleep that she might be brought forth. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45 Acts 20 verse 28 Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he, she, hath purchased with his, her, own blood. As a menstruous woman. Lamentations chapter 1 verse 17. In the Passover Seder, the matzah represents their oneness, broken in half. She is the dessert half, hidden until the end of time, before the marriage, the afikaman that is put back together with the Yahshua half at the end of the meal. The bread represents the flesh. The cup, the blood, water. 
the daughter as his bride, and as his equal, is equal in the flesh. As Adam and Eve in type were both equal in the flesh, so are the second Adam and Eve. The daughter is his sister, his spouse, and that makes her our mother. Who has ever been birthed by their sister, no. She is our mother who births us through the water nourishment in the womb. As Messiah Yahshua spoke. John, 3 verse 5 Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, 7 Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. She is cleaning us up, preparing her garment for her wedding. Her stainless, unwrinkled garment is our righteousness, the righteousness of the saints who have all seven messages. When the number is made up, she will have the garment change, Zechariah chapter 3. In other words, when she has cleansed those who are to be counted, when that number is made, she has prepared herself. The saints will get the white garment when she gets it. The ordeal of the Holy Spirit Mother, Daughter, a spiritual birth, the water has broken. Strong's Hebrew 4726, Makor, a spring, fountain. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 1 In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. There are several different fountains in the Hebrew scriptures. This one, is also found in the word as first usage, when a man and woman have relations during her sickness, they have discovered her fountain. This also ties in with our sins are as filthy menstrual rags, according to Isaiah. She is put away, as in Nida, here on earth because of our sins. A wife has to be separated from her husband when she is bleeding, she is unclean. The Holy Ghost has become unclean for us on earth, cleansing us from our filthiness, our sins, on a daily basis. The Spirit of Prophecy announced this message of comfort to those who are living in the final days of earth's history. It points forward to the final ministration of the Divine Daughter through the ministry of the angels. Lois said in an audio tape said that the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 40 to Jerusalem, she is Jerusalem, that her warfare is over as present truth. Her warfare is over when she completes the seven messages. She is now waiting for the number of those who believe her to be made up. This effectively stops the cycle of sinning and repenting, her bleeding and for a pure fountain of water to manifest, first in truth, then in reality, for those who believe the message. Again, the ending of the cycle of sinning and repenting is about our faith in her perfect sanctifying work. It is sanctification by faith. Acts 15 verse 8, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. 15 verse 9 and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. With the blood covering, the warfare is still on, and while our sins are stored, with the water intercession, our sins are immediately washed away making us clean.